traditional psychologists tell us that in a teaching session, your retention is best for the first and the last session. So that's, so that's the advantage that I have. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is the fact that I'm the one holding you back from all the good things beyond that door. So I promise to stick to my 20 minutes. And uh, I chose to essentially focus on uh, the diagnosis of antibody-mediated rejection, giving you highlights from the updates of the BAMF 2019 meeting. For those of you who follow these things, you'll be aware the 2021 meeting is happening in about two weeks' time but we don't really expect much in the way of changes. This is a, a very rough outline of my talk. So the thing I want to point out there is, and I think some of the speakers have mentioned this, is a, yes, that, line there that shows that almost relentless rise in the incidence of antibody mediated rejection, contrasting it to the incidence of cellular mediated rejection. And this essentially explains the rates of graft loss long term. And this, this has been actually uh, found in almost all transplant centers. And I think uh, Dr. Koech mentioned about this, that you know, rejection still remains a problem despite all the problem, all the advances that we have in uh, treatment. Just a reminder, I think Dr. Baraza went through this, but antibody-mediated rejection is essentially damage to the graft tissue uh, mediated by antibodies and specifically damage to the endothelium in the graft. This is important because it kind of uh, helps us uh, identify rejection on biopsies. So these are the BAMF 2019 diagnostic categories. And of course, for the purposes of this talk, I'm mostly focusing, entirely focusing on uh, category two, which uh, in the BAMF nomenclature is actually described as antibody mediated changes. Uh, we will see why, because some of these may or may not represent a form of rejection. So the idea of the current uh, BAMF diagnostic system is that we begin with a series of definitions. Then we have what we call BAMF uh, lesion scores, right? Where we quantify if you are seeing glomerulitis, for example, uh, if you have C4D positivity, add that to additional diagnostic parameters. And you really do need additional clinical information. So to exclude, for example, another cause of TMA, sometimes very difficult in patients or calcineurin, calcineurin inhibitors, uh, to exclude other causes of acute tubular injury. We combine that information to come up with a BAMF diagnostic uh, category. So these are the categories within antibody-mediated changes. Now, obviously, hyperacute rejection, we don't get biopsies for that, so that's not part of the BAMF classification. And we prefer to use the term active antibody-mediated rejection rather than acute antibody-mediated rejection. Uh, some, somewhat of a controversial point because we also say acute T-cell-mediated rejection. So hopefully this is one of the things the meeting this year will address. We do need to standardize this uh, terminology. Uh, the next entity would be chronic active antibody mediated rejection, chronic inactive antibody mediated rejection, and finally a category that may or may not represent rejection if you have C4D staining in a biopsy that doesn't have any other evidence of rejection. So how do we decide that a biopsy has active antibody mediated rejection? So you must have this three criteria, that there is evidence of acute tissue injury on the biopsy, there's evidence of current or recent antibody interaction in the vascular endothelium, and that you have serologic evidence of circulating donor-specific antibodies. Uh, obviously, then you also need that you do not have any evidence of chronic tissue injury because that would make it a different category. This are the features we use to determine whether or not we do have uh, acute tissue injury. So 
microvascular inflammation, which is uh, glomerulitis and peritubular capillaritis. So in essence, what in a native biopsy we'd say is endocapillary hypercellularity in a graft biopsy then becomes glomerulitis. But you do need to exclude uh, de novo or recurrent glomerulonephritis. Intimal or transmural arteritis, again, remember this refers to damage to the endothelium of large blood vessels. And the last two are things we don't always think about, that acute thrombotic microangiopathy and tubular injury in the absence of any other cause may actually be a diagnostic of antibody-mediated rejection. Just a cartoon, to, well, photomicrographs to show what we mean by glomerulitis. I have mentioned that the presence of inflammatory cells within the glomeruli, what would usually refer to as endocapillary hypercellularity in a native uh, biopsy, now we call glomerulitis. And then we quantify it based on the extent within the biopsy. This is uh, images just show you what we mean by peritubular capillaritis. And these are the capillaries that are present in between the tubules. And you literally just count the number of cells in there to determine uh, what uh, score it's going to be, one, two, three, depending on the number of uh, the involved vessels. Uh, that's just an example of arteritis ranging from the most minor form where you really just have uh, elevation of the endothelium and the blue dots represent you know, inflammatory cells. Uh, again, we assign a score. So both for glomerulitis and arteritis, really any of that is consistent with, but we'll see that for some of the other lesions, then you do need to uh, quantify in order to decide whether or not you have rejection. This is an example of thrombotic microangiopathy uh, where you have thrombus there within the afferent arterioles and there within uh, the glomerulus itself. You would then need to decide really whether or not this is due to CNIs or not. And you know that's not always easy. Uh, it helps if you have additional features suggestive of rejection within the biopsy to decide that yes, this represents a spectrum of uh, antibody mediated rejection. So what do we mean by evidence of recent antibody interaction? So either one of these. So one, the presence of C4D staining in peritubular capillaries or the vasa recta of the medulla. Uh, you can actually use a combination of glomerulitis and peritubular ca capillaritis uh, to decide that yes, that is evidence of uh, recent, antibody reject, uh, recent antibody interaction with the endothelium. And there's been quite some work out of Canada about using the expression of gene transcripts uh, or classifiers. This, I think at the time of the current of, of this BAMF classification, this was actually molecular study on kidney biopsy tissue. Uh, I think since then, there's been quite some work on doing it in blood. And you know, I guess that's attractive to uh, nephrologists because at some point it may even obviate the need for going ahead and doing a biopsy. Uh, it's not uh, by coincidence that uh, the speakers who spoken before about graft rejection did not actually talk about C4D. Uh, why? Because C4D is actually a biologically inactive compound. It doesn't do anything, at least nothing that you know about uh, so far. C4D is a byproduct of the cleavage of C4, mostly for the purposes of uh, rejection through the classical pathway, but occasionally through the lactate pathway. Now, ironically, the fact that it doesn't do anything is useful to a pathologist because it means that it's not quickly removed from the tissue. Unlike all the other uh, active products which need to be cleared out of the circulation. So we use C4D as a sort of footprint because it hangs around so long to tell us that antibody was here. And essentially what we do is uh, look for any staining on uh, immunohistochemistry, circumferential. There is actually a scoring system if you do it on immunofluorescence. I find the immunohistochemistry much easier to interpret because you can see the architecture of the tissue. Uh, so the third criterion would be serologic evidence of uh, circulating uh, donor-specific antibodies to HLA in most cases or to other antigens. 
And you can also, as I have mentioned, uh, use validated transcripts. But again, the presence of positivity for C4D can actually substitute for this uh, criterion three, right? And I, I think, again, this is one of those things we really need to work out rather than having a third criterion, just have the two criterion together so that you know, everybody knows that C4D or serologic uh, confirmation of DSA is good enough. So the second category there would be chronic active antibody mediated dejection. So we are just looking at the criteria for active antibody mediated dejection. And here the difference is that we are looking for morphologic evidence of chronic tissue injury rather than acute tissue injury as we did for active antibody mediated dejection. So what do we see on morphology? So essentially three things. One is transplant glomerulopathy. Two is severe peritubular capillary basement membrane multilayering, and three uh, arterial intimal fibrosis of new onset. Uh, so this raises the point that how do you know it's new onset? That means that you know at some point you either did a biopsy before the transplant or you've done a biopsy before. And in many cases, if you see a significant amount of intimal fibrosis, you may or may not know whether it's uh, new onset. But again, like I said you really do need to put together uh, all the other additional features. So the idea of diagnosing rejection on uh, electron microscopy, again, is one of those controversial things, because this would suggest that uh, whenever you're doing a biopsy for a graft that has been present for more than a year, you should seriously consider submitting uh, material for electron microscopy in order to detect this very early stage of GBM double contouring that is only detectable on uh, EM. But the other two stages can actually be detected on uh, light microscopy evaluation. Just to remember that transplant glomerulopathy may not always be as a result of uh, rejection. Uh, this is the other entity described as severe peritubular capillary uh, basement membrane multilayer, where you're really just counting the number of layers you see. Again, exclusively on EM, uh, may not always be available. And even in the best centers, uh, they do not routinely do electron microscopy on uh, graft biopsies. Uh, I think that's an example of, uh, uh, yes, arterial fibrosis with quite some amount of uh, thickening. That's a very large uh, involved artery there. So the category of chronic active antibody mediated dejection actually encompasses quite a number of uh, lesions, which can have significant activity with minimal chronicity and some with mild activity. So that's minor glomerulitis, minor peritubular capillaritis and uh, significant uh, chronicity. So the current recommendation is that when we report graft biopsies, we should actually put the scores in there. I don't know if it makes you know, a big difference to the nephrologist. Uh, I guess many of the times all you want to know is, is there rejection or not? As to whether there is mild activity and severe chronicity, you, know, you tell me what you use that information for. The BAMF system uh, you know, tells me to put it there so I will. Uh, so, the last, second last category here would be uh, chronic inactive antibody mediated dejection, where you do have the changes suggestive of chronic injury, but you don't have any uh, current evidence of recent uh, or ongoing uh, antibody interaction with the endothelium. Uh, there's some argument about whether a historical DSA, for example, uh, would be consistent with prior uh, prior evidence of uh, antibody within uh, the patient serum. And we don't really have a definition of how far back you need to go in order to say this is recent or uh, remote. Again, one of those things that you know, uh, needs to be clarified. Uh, the other category is C4D staining without evidence of rejection, where essentially all you're seeing is C4D if you're doing this routinely in your biopsies. And 
does that represent rejection or not, right? This is why the category in the BAMF uh, system is actually known as antibody mediated changes, because I guess the jury is still out. We don't have enough data as to whether this represents, you know, some form of uh, rejection. Uh, the other opinion is that it might actually represent a form of tolerance. So the antibodies are there because the C4D signature is present. But the reason you don't have any damage is because you know the body doesn't uh, actually produce a response leading to uh, damage. So is that tolerance or not? Uh, finally, we frequently encounter scenarios in which we have uh, evidence of uh, damage to vascular endothelium in the form of glomerulitis and peritubular capillaritis. But again, there are no detectable antibodies against the graft. So far, at least at the time of the BAMF 2019, the clinical implications of this finding were unclear. But some have argued that maybe we do need to seriously reconsider reintroducing the category of suspicious uh, for antibody-mediated uh, rejection, which was there, I think, up to around the BAMF 2012 meeting, and then was removed. So, you know, some of those things we need to find more data on and, you know, eventually come to some kind of uh, way forward. So before this paper was published, in order to understand how a kidney biopsy is reported, you needed to, to read all the previous birth papers. The good thing about this paper is that it really put together all the definitions of the lesions and what they mean. So really right now, if you want to know uh, what's present in a kidney graft biopsy. All you need to do is uh, refer to this paper and the most current uh, BAMF meeting report. And you know, it actually has a table that shows you what the lesions are, what the scores are, and what that is uh, for the diagnosis. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.